It's a great joy for me to have the opportunity once again of sharing in a Bible study with an emphasis upon what the Lord has to say, particularly regarding the last days. I'm not quite sure how it was I got allocated the subject for tonight, I may well have chosen it myself. I I don't really remember, so I can't blame anybody, but I do know this, when I started out to study it, I was a little fearful as to uh, just what I was going to be able to bring to you. But the more I studied God's word, the more I enjoyed the subject. And I come to you tonight confident in this that I have benefited from the study and irrespective of what you get or don't get out of the study there's at least one person has got something even if it's only the preacher. But I hope that you do get something out of our study tonight. God has a purpose, you know, even for such a small entity as Gaza or Gaza. I'm not really sure. I I would always have called it Gaza, but I suppose listening to all the news reports, it has become sort of uh, common to call it Gaza. So you might find me going in between the two of them now and again and switching back and forth. But it is our privilege as Christians to know the purpose of God. God has shared with us what he is going to do in the future. Write down to very minute details regarding obscure nations, certainly nations that perhaps we personally don't really know much about. Yet the Bible tells us what God is going to do regarding (coughs) those nations. Now I am of the mind that if God reveals something, then it's vital for us to give due attention to that something. If we neglect anything that God has revealed in his word, it is to our cost. And inevitably, that ignorance will indeed cost us. Let me give you an example. In the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I often turn to this passage to illustrate the truth of the importance of studying the Word of God. The last chapter of the Gospel of Luke and you have two individuals whose names are not given to us. I wonder if the Lord in kindness concealed their names uh, to save them embarrassment. The two on the road to Emmaus. You remember how they were joined on their journey away from Jerusalem. Which of course was contrary to the will of God for he had told them that they should Not leave Jerusalem, but they should stay in Jerusalem. He had told them how he would die, but the third day he would rise again. Now you would think that if a believer was told by the Lord Jesus personally, I'm going to die, you'd want to be there to see that. And if he said on the third day I'm going to rise again. You think you would want to be there to see that. 
But here they are going away. And they're going away and going away in utter despair and desolation. They couldn't understand what had happened at Jerusalem. And we know that the Savior began to deal with them and to teach them. Look at what we read in verse 25. You, you know these words. You know these verses very well indeed. Then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. <coughs> Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Moses and all the prophets had taught about the death of Christ and his resurrection. And the Lord Jesus, during his ministry, especially as the time of his death drew near, repeatedly emphasized, what was going to happen at Jerusalem. But it seems to have fallen on deaf ears. So that when it happened. It caught them unprepared. Unawares. Ill informed. Ignorant. As if they had never ever heard anything. About the death the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They had been given these glorious truths, but they had paid no heed to them. And in consequence of that, when the truths came to pass, they were at a total loss. They were thrown into confusion. Now, men and women, there is a lesson there for us to learn. There are days coming upon this world, events that will break forth upon Christendom, those nations in which there is a knowledge, to some degree or other, of the truth of God. There's going to be events take place in those nations. Primarily around Israel and circulating out from there. And if we have never read or studied these things. Or taken heed to what it is God has shared with us. We are going to be every bit as foolish. As were the two on the road to a mess. Every bit as worthy. Of being called fools and slow to believe what has been revealed to us. God has a purpose. And the series of messages that have been set forth in these Sovereign Grace Advent Testimonies have been looking at God's purpose for various nations. And it's important for us to study such. Many people might think, what an obscure Bible study. What possible purpose can there be in such a pursuit? <laughs> I can only ask you in answer to that question. If it's of no real purpose for us to study God's purpose for Gaza, why did he tell us it? Why did he set out his purpose in the Bible regarding this tiny dot on the map of the world? If there's no purpose in studying it, then surely there must have been no purpose in God revealing it. And dare we say that into the face of the Almighty? Dare we say that to the Almighty? That you have written, prophesied, Caused your prophets on many occasions to put down on record that which has really no purpose. That's the logic. 
That's the logic of such a criticism as may be leveled against us uh, for taking up a topic such as, as this. Well, before we go any further, having uttered those few remarks, I'd like us just to bow in a word of prayer that we might ask the Lord for his help and his blessing. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come to study thy word tonight. We come, Lord, just to look at, read together, and consider at least some of the implications of what it is thou hast said regarding Gaza. Lord, bring us close to thee. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy word. Lord Jesus, thou art to be found in these passages, no matter how obscure men may consider them to be. Thou art there, Lord. For every word that thou dost speak reveals thy heart. Reveals thy love, reveals thy wisdom, reveals thy power, reveals thy glory. O oh Lord, show us thy glory tonight. I pray that you will help me. Lord, so limited, so helpless, so weak, fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost, I ask of thee, Lord, now. And may we for a while sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus in this place. We thank thee for the use of this building and for the kindness shown toward this group. We pray, Lord, that thou will bless those who have thus shown this kindness for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, I have no specific passage uh, to set before you as a text, but rather we're going to wander about through the Old Testament somewhat this evening as the Lord will lead us. But let me just give a few opening remarks regarding Gaza. It is reckoned by men to be one of the oldest cities in the world. The name of which is found in the annals written of men right back to the earliest of such writings. It has passed through many phases and has experienced many changes over that time. Invasion has followed invasion. It has felt the weight and the power of neighboring nations <coughs> who have exerted themselves against their neighbors. But despite all that, <coughs> it is still here upon the earth. It hasn't been obliterated. It hasn't ceased to be. In more modern times, moving into this Christian era, the most significant invasion that Gaza was subject to was that of the Rashidun army, a name which perhaps you may not immediately recognize, but the Rashidun army was the primary military force of the Muslim conquests of the 7th century. At the beginning of those Muslim <coughs> conquests, that army stood about 13, 14, 15,000 men. As that era, it really was but a local force. 
But by 657, some 25 years after the first invasion of Giza by the Muslims, the Muslim army had reached a sizable force estimated at some 100,000 well-armed, well-disciplined troops. I believe that that invasion all that time ago in the 7th century has shaped modern Gaza and the president, uh, present rather implacable Muslim fanatical name that one associates with Gaza stems from what happened back then in the 7th century. But it's the Gaza of the Bible and what it is that God has to say about it that we'll seek we will seek to occupy ourselves with uh, this evening. The name Gaza means the strong. That doubtless is a name they gave themselves. And in a certain sense, it's a name that befitted them because they did show themselves strong in the face of the centuries of opposition that they encountered. Strong to the degree they survived as an entity. But I think too it betokens their pride and they thought themselves as the strong, the strong people. Now when in Bible study you take up a topic such as this, There is a simple rule, and I'm sure it has been observed by every previous speaker when they have looked at whatever topic they were required to examine, and that is the rule of the first reference or the first mention in the Bible. And when we turn to the first mention of Gaza in the Bible, we find ourselves, of course, in the book of Genesis. Would you please turn back to that book that ushers us to the very dawn of time and to the emerging nations. Of course, nations that centered uh, upon the Middle East. In Genesis chapter 10, uh, let me just read to you from the verse 19 of that chapter it says this and the border of the Canaanites was from Zidon as thou comest to Gerar unto Gaza as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam even unto Lasha Now, here we find, in the midst of that little cluster of names, Gaza. But it's the company in which God places Gaza on this, the first reference in the Bible to this region that I want you to particularly take note of. God is here talking about the Canaanites. The Canaanites. The descendants of Canaan. And he's telling us their borders. It stretches uh, from the northern city of Zidon. Right up there on the coast of that region. Somewhat north today of Israel's border. And it stretched right down the Mediterranean coast, uh, to the region of Gerar and Gaza, and then coming inland, westward, 
uh, or sorry, eastward, we find it encompassing Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Lasha. The territory of the Canaanites then is marked out by cities that became notorious. Notorious in their rebellion against God. And I have no doubt that when you see Gaza linked with Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain that are here mentioned, that that does indicate to us something of the nature of this city of Gaza. My old grandmother used to say, and I'm sure she was quoting her grandmother, and how far back the quoting goes, I'm not sure. But she used to say, show me your company, and I'll tell you who you are. And God here shows us the company of Gaza. And surely we cannot... But stop a moment and take note of this. God's saying something about Gaza when he places it amongst the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. When it was one of the chief cities of the nation of the Canaanites. Now the, the people of Gaza, as part of the Canaanite nation, we're a cursed people. They were a cursed people. Now, let me say that all men are under the curse of God. All men. For since the fall of Adam, the judgment of God has come upon all nations. You remember what we read in Galatians chapter 3, just to give this a, co- a gospel context. Galatians chapter 3 and the verse 10 of that chapter. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Every man who defies God's law, who fails to keep God's law, who breaks God's law, is under the curse. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All men are under the curse. But here is a people who, though cursed with the rest of mankind, came under a specific curse. A specific curse. If you look at Genesis chapter 9, we read the origins of this curse that I'm speaking about. You know what has happened here in Genesis chapter 9. Noah has emerged upon a new world. A world after the flood. But it wasn't a world without sin. It wasn't a world without sin. Only eight people had survived the judgment of God that had befallen a sinful, wicked generation. You can read in chapter 6 of the wickedness of that generation. But sin had not been purged from the world. That awful virus was to be found in the nature of the eight that God had spared. And thus we find the son of Noah engaged in a gross wickedness. And the story is told of that wickedness. And Noah, upon realizing the wickedness that had taken place upon his person, By his offspring utters a curse. Verse 25. Cursed be Canaan. The servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now Ham, the father of Canaan, was the offender. 
He was the offender. It was he who had sinned against his father Noah. Though doubtless, I think we can see in the curse that fell upon Canaan an implication that Canaan was somehow or other linked to this wretched wickedness. And the curse that fell upon Canaan would of course fall also upon his father Ham. Because a father cannot see punishment fall on a child without himself suffering. And in this complex little situation, I have no doubt that the judgment of God, whatever form it took, that fell upon Canaan, would have borne deep into the heart and the soul of his father Ham as well. But that judgment, that curse that God threw, uh, Noah uttered, for it was a, a curse that came from God. It had outworkings in the nation of the Canaanites that will be seen until the end of time itself. The curse that befell the Canaanite people was a most terrible imprecation. In this day when people, English speaking people, have lost contact with the Bible and consequently many words and phrases in the scriptures carry very little meaning uh, to uh, people today and one assumes when one comes on the word curse in the Bible or many would assume when they come upon this word that this was just the uttering of uh, uh, an expletive an outburst of anger that involved foul language but it's nothing of that sort at all Nothing of that sort at all. It was a holy utterance. <coughs> it was the manifestation of holy wrath against sin. That's an entirely different thing from the modern usage of the word. God employs the same word as here appears in Genesis 9 and 25, God employs that same word a number of occasions, uh, which uh, perhaps I could just give you in order that you might see the implications of the word. If you turn back further to uh, Genesis chapter 3, where we are taken into the Garden of Eden, that scene of tragedy, indeed, when man sinned against God and thus began every woe, every sorrow, every grief, every tear that has ever fallen. And in response to what happened in the garden, we read in the verse 14 of Genesis chapter 3, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, we're talking about the creature that was the instrument used of the devil to cause the fall of man. And this statement to the serpent is of course directed toward the devil who as it were stood in the shadow of the serpent. Because thou hast done this thou art cursed. That's the same word. That is thus employed when Noah spoke against Canaan. This uttering of wrath and judgment against an offender by God. It, it, it occurs. Adam again. He said, that's the Lord said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife 
and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. The ground, the earth has been cursed. The wrath of God has been directed towards the physical earth. And that which had been a paradise, producing everything that man could desire, suddenly became a hostile environment, producing thorns and thistles. And everything that made life on the earth difficult. Difficult. In the sweat of a man's brow, as he seeks to wrest a living from the earth, is an evidence of that curse that fell upon it. If you go to chapter 4, you find that word employed again. And I'm seeking to try and (coughs) fill out the meaning of of the word just by showing you where it is used. Chapter 4, the verse 11. God is speaking to Cain, the first murderer. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee your strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. The implications of these words uttered by God fill Cain with horror. He says in verse 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. The implication of those words were plain to Cain. And he said to God, this is more than I can bear. Now might I tell you, As we see the outworking of that curse in the three examples I've given you, the devil, the earth, and Cain. What is the outworking? Well, for the devil, he one day will be cast into fire that has been prepared for him and his angels from all eternity. The earth Why, it will perish. It will be burned up one day, according to Peter. And also, in the book of the Revelation, it will be burned up one day. As the outworking of that curse. And Cain, well, in Jude chapter 11, it's worth reminding ourselves of just what we find there in that little book, that so important little book, Woe unto them. He's speaking of those infiltrators of the church of Jesus Christ who will give themselves to corrupting the gospel in every generation. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Korah, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That's the outworking of the curse of God upon Cain. A curse that many others will share with Cain. So when we read that God's curse came upon Canaan and his descendants, then we must recognize that those who dwell in Gaza were a people under an awful curse. An awful curse indeed. And we need to bear that in mind. The cities mentioned in that first reference to Gaza. 
in Genesis chapter 10, were all destroyed by the fire of God. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam. They were destroyed under the fire of God. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and the verse 23 says this. And the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown nor beareth nor any grass groweth therein. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah Adma and Zeboam, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. There's those four cities, first mentioned in company with Gaza in Genesis chapter 19. The reference I've just given you is Deuteronomy chapter 29 and the verse 23. Burned up. I've often said that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah was a foretaste of the awful judgment that will fall upon the world generally, upon wicked men. What was poured out upon Sodom and Gomorrah is the fire, the everlasting fire into which wicked men will be cast. It was a fire that came down from God. It's God's fire against sin. God's fire against sin. And it helps us to understand, as we look at this first reference to Gaza, just how it stands in relationship to God and to judgment. Gaza was also linked with an infamous people called the Anakims. Look at Joshua chapter 11. We're conducting a study tonight that is akin, I suppose, to the work of a detective. We're coming to a crime scene. Picks up this little bit and that little bit and that other little bit. And examining these items closely draws deductions from them. And we're, we're looking at the references that God has given us regarding Giza. And in the little snippets of information, although I don't want to I don't want to suggest that there's little to be found in these verses. I, I, I don't want to say that at all. Though to our eyes sometimes the information given us in texts appears to be small. <coughs> appears to be small. But that's more a case of the poor eyesight that we have when it comes to looking at the information God gives us. Oh, if God were to open our eyes, we'd see much more. We'd understand much, much more. So I I don't want to at at all give the impression that God has been mean in his dispersing of information. But nevertheless, it is a small little reference. And and if we do rightly examine it and consider it and analyze it and look at it in the light of other scriptures, we will find that it yields. It will yield much information. In Joshua chapter 11 then, the verse 22. Well, verse 21. At that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains. From Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land. Only. 
in Gaza. Only in Gaza. Now there's, there is a most wonderful little item of information there that, that helps us to understand the nature and the character of Gaza and its people. Now, the Anakims, you know they were giants. I, not for one moment, will try to explain to you the exact origins of these giants. We can trace the Hebrew word employed back to Genesis chapter 6. But I, for one, cannot, I feel I dare not, try to expound or explain what is found in Genesis chapter 6. I'd gladly sit at the feet of any man who feels he is capable of explaining Genesis chapter 6. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. Days of unparalleled wickedness that will not be paralleled until the closing days of this age just before the Savior returns. They were days of dreadful wickednesses. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. I, I honestly, I have, I have views, I have my own idea of what this means, but I've never felt confident enough to say, this is what I think you should believe, or this is what I feel uh, this word means beyond doubt. I've never felt confident enough to say that. It's a mystery, I feel it's a mystery. But from this time, there were these giants and they seem to reside particularly among the Canaanites they were part of the Canaanite race and we're told here in Joshua chapter 11 the verse 22 that the last place that they found a refuge was in Gaza Israel under God was able to eradicate them defeat them, destroy them Except in Gaza. And I, I, I feel that that underscores for us the resilience of this people of Gaza. <clears throat> they were a people able to resist God's chosen people. And that, even in the days of their strength and their power, even in days of God's blessing upon the tribes, days when they saw wonderful exploits done, they come up short when faced by these Anakims that dwelt in Gaza and in its precincts. They had been defeated, as we read in verse 21, in the mountainous areas, but not in Gaza. Not in Gaza. And we can but draw the conclusion from that at least uh, that there was tenacity. There was resilience. There was a spirit of defiance about the Gazaites. That made them more than a match for Israel at that time. Even in the days of her fullest power and greatest blessings, Judah just was not able to overcome. And rather, it seems that Judah was forced to coexist with the Gazaites. Look at what you read in, in, in Joshua, the, the chapter 15. And Ashdod and her towns and her villages... Gaza with her towns and her villages and the river of Egypt and the great sea and the border thereof. Here we have an outlining of 
of the territories that made up the inheritance of the people of God, especially the tribe of Judah. And right there in the middle of them, there was the city of Gaza and associated cities. And they were dwelling there, existing there, cheek by jowl, as we would say, with the people of God. Judges chapter 1. Do we have another reference? And again, this, this teaches us the same truth. Judges chapter 1 and the uh, verse 18. Also Judah took Gaza with the coasts thereof, and Ashkelon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountains, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. Here again is this spirit of resilience, this spirit of defiance, this superiority of strength that, that caused the people of Gaza, as it were, to stand head and shoulder above all the other Canaanite regions and tribes. There was something that we need to take note of regarding this people of Gaza and the fact that it was the last refuge of the Anakims. You turn to the book of Samuel. Time is passing now. And the years are going past. And we're advancing to a time when hundreds of years have passed over the nation. And in First Samuel chapter 6, we encounter Gaza again. First Samuel chapter 6 and the verse 16. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. Now, I, I, the context is not really that important, but you can re remember what happened. The Philistines had attacked Israel. <clears throat> they had completely defeated Israel, took away the Ark of the Covenant. And here we have reference to the five lords of the Philistines. And those five lords resided in the chief cities. And one of them, of course, was Gaza. One of them was Gaza. If anything, the Philistines had become more strong, had consolidated themselves, and, and Judah and Israel had retreated so that the Gazaites and their compatriots among the neighboring cities of the Philistines had become much more an independent nation again, reasserted itself. Oh, what resilience they showed. You know, there is a lesson for you and for me, spiritually in this. Because just as uh, there was these two conflicting nations occupying this one territory, so there is in you and in me, if we're truly saved, two, conf con two conflicting entities. The flesh... The new nature. The flesh and the new nature. The victorious Christian is the one who under God's grace has advanced hard against the flesh and cut it off. Mortified the flesh and brought it down to a place of death. Though we will never be able to utterly and completely eradicate the flesh while we are at home in the body. Backsliding occurs 
in the child of God when through carelessness they begin to retreat in the face of the flesh and they give way to its appetites and its desires and its demands and its temptations and it reasserts itself and begins to take back the territory of the life from which it had been expelled when we had first experienced the wonderful grace of God. It's as if the man of Gadara, who under God's grace had ceased to be the wild creature that he was and was found seated at the feet of Jesus. He who in his wickedness had displayed awful immodesty and ran naked. But here, the grace of God had caused him to be clothed. He who had been mad is now in his right mind. That's what the grace of God had done. But if that man suddenly threw off his clothes again, began once more to live as a madman, and defy everything that was decent and proper and took himself away from the feet of Jesus and yielded himself to every wicked impulse. That reversal of the blessings that had come upon him through grace is what backsliding is all about. Backsliding is the Philistine taking over again the territory which had been taken from him and occupied by the people of God in the past day of blessing. That's the lesson we can surely learn from this. But as we continue to pursue the references given us in God's word about the region of Gaza, the Philistines, we discover that they were among the chief enemies. The chief enemies of Israel. Now Israel had many enemies. (laughs) Indeed I suppose it can be said that everybody outside of Israel was an enemy of Israel. But chief among them were the people of Gaza. Look at what it says in Uh, Judges the chapter 6 Judges chapter 6 here's one of the many invasions of the holy land the land of Israel by the enemies of God and it might be worth us remembering that this invasion was a chastening from the Lord because of their backsliding As verse 1 of Judges chapter 6 clearly states, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Listen, you and I need to learn, you cannot sin against the Lord and get away with it. You cannot do that. Neither individuals or church congregations or denominations or nations. No one can sin against God and escape the consequences. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. God's on the throne, you know. God's on the throne. Please, please think yourself into the politics of of this age uh, that we're reading about. There were There were men among the Israelites who who told the people, look, look, it's time to modernize. It's time to put aside these old notions that we have. And let's branch out. Let's let's alter our, our lifestyle. And in every field of activity, Sabbath keeping, the worship of God, the tendons at the tabernacle, the moral and social consequences that sprang from the worship of God and the teaching of his word, these things were set aside. And there was an embracing, doubtless, 
of a lifestyle more in keeping with the nations round about. That's what happened. When it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's what it means. That's what it means. In the sight of the Lord. Not in the sight of men. Just as today we, we have a government in this country. Not to mention the government in my country. That embarks down roads of policy. That are based upon what they think. And what they see. That's right. The reasoning of men. See, Sodom is right. The prime minister of this land said, gay marriage is right. It's only proper, it seems. Right. Just. How can we deny such a thing? And in the eyes of men, it's all very proper and plausible. But not in the eyes of God. And let me tell you, What comes upon a nation is governed by how God sees that nation act. God saw that Israel did wrong, so God delivered them into the hand of Midian. He delivered them into the hand of Midian. He delivered them into the hand of Midian. That phrase, so simply it falls off our tongue. Oh, but my friend, what a solemn <coughs> thing this is. God will hand us into the hand of our enemies if we offend them. If we offend them. And you know, the Midianites came and they took over the land. And here's the point that I want to make, for we're back to thinking of Gaza and where it features in this in the verse 4 well read verse 3 and so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till they come unto Gaza the Midianites stopped at Gaza. They stopped at Gaza. I believe they didn't overflow Gaza. They didn't strip Gaza of <coughs> the fruits of the earth. Gaza was left alone. Why? Because they were in confederacy with the Midianites. They were one and the same. They were of the same spirit. And the Midianites saw them as such. And so they let them alone. They let them alone. Hmm. You know, my dear friend, had I a mind to tonight, I could start rehearsing to you incidents in the 30 odd years of terrorism. That my generation in Ulster has lived through. And we could show you how the time and time again. Shootings. Bombings. Etc. took place. And everyone who had sympathy with the bombers. Or with those lying in ambush. Were tipped off. Don't be in the neighborhood. Stay away. That happened time and time again. Time and time again. Because there was a conspiracy, there was a confederacy between the lawless terrorist and those within our society who had an affiliation with them. Just as you had it here. The trouble stopped at Gaza. The trouble stopped at Gaza. They were ever a source of trouble to God's people. 
Again, I, I turn you to Judges, this time chapter 16, where there begins the story of a great man who sadly had a great fall and he fell at the hands of the Philistines and the people of Gaza. I'm talking about Samson. I'm talking about Samson. And time and time again as you read through the Bible you will see this little location. It's not very big. It's only a city and the precincts of it and associates in other cities and yet they were an abiding source of trouble and affliction and vexation for Israel. A source of trouble for God's people. You know it was out of this area that there came the clearest foreshadowing of the Antichrist. In all the collection of foreshadowings that God provides us with in the Bible. I'm talking about Goliath. I'm talking about Goliath. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. And, and really my time is gone. I'm amazed that it has gone so quickly. But we'll try now to tie things up as quickly as possible. 1 Samuel chapter 17. In Goliath, and the information given us of him by God is so worthy of the closest examination. His name means splendor. He was deemed a splendid example, no doubt, of manhood. He's a man, first of all, quickly notice this, I'll, I'll, I'll not take time, too long. He's a man marked by the number six. In verse four of First Samuel 17, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. That's in the Gaza Strip today whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had a helmet, he had a coat of mail, he had greaves of brass, and a target of brass, and a spear, and a shield. Six items of armament are here listed for us. Six in the Bible does have an ominous association, let's say number of man. We read of the Antichrist having the mysterious number 666. <laughs> Men have sought to give you their notions as to what that means and they've come up with Greek and Latin and I don't know how many other interpretations. When the day comes we'll understand it without Greek, Hebrew, Latin lexicons. It'll be there for every man and every nation of the earth who has an interest in these things irrespective of the language he speaks to understand what that means. But six is a, a, an ominous number and it was one that featured upon uh, Goliath. He, he had a man going before him and not take time to go into the, the Antichrist and the man who goes before him called the false prophet. The battle between David and Goliath <coughs> took, took place on David's second visit to the camp of Israel. His second visit. Stead there. You have to do a little bit of examination but we read in verse 15 of First Samuel 17 and David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem 
So he had been in the camp, he goes back to Bethlehem, and then he is sent by his father back again with food for his brethren, and that's when he encounters Goliath. That's when he hears the, the, the great giant shouting out and defying God from the hill opposite the Israelites. Not a lovely picture. The Lord Jesus has been to the camp of Israel. He's visited his brother. He's gone back to his father. But he's, <coughs> he's coming again one day. He's coming again one day and he will encounter the Antichrist. As Paul says, 2 Thessalonians 2, and he will destroy him. He will destroy him with the spirit of his mouth. The spirit of his mouth. Again, I'll take you another little further. Goliath defied Israel and Israel's God. Something the Antichrist of course, is going to do. Up until the moment that David defeated Goliath, he was despised. Did not his brethren mock him? What are you doing here? Should you not be at home with the sheep? That's where you ought to be. And they mocked him and they despised him. So is Christ despised by Israel today. And he will be until the day God causes their eyes to open and they look upon him whom they pierced and will be brought to repentance. So out of Gaza came one of the clearest, clearest examples or foreshadowings of the Antichrist that you have in the Bible. The cruelty, the cruelty that is today displayed in Gaza. Because they are a cruel people. We hear of their doings all the time in the press, though you don't hear a fraction of the terrorism that is wrought. They have taught the world what we went through in Ulster for 30 odd years was largely springing from the teaching that the IRA received from the Palestinian terrorists. And the cruelty that is so linked with Gaza today was seen back then in early times in how they treated poor old Samson. They took him. We read in Judges 16 and verse 21, they put out his eyes and they brought him down to Gaza. You know, in many ways, God draws a veil over it. He doesn't tell us all that Samson suffered at their hands. Again, that's a poignant point to me. You know, men and women, I, I know that in the 30 years of terrorism, I don't know why I find myself turning to this, it's not in my notes. But in the 30 years of terrorism, coming as I do from the border areas, there was many as a poor policeman, a poor part-time policeman, a poor part-time soldier in the UDR, who was a daytime uh, farmer or some other field of labour, was captured by the IRA. And within a day or so it was reported his body has been found on some little road near the border. And that's all you read. But if you knew the details, never reported. When the coroner examined the body, he didn't report what he found. The butchery. The unspeakable cruelty enacted by men upon the body of their victims. I'm sure God has drawn a veil over what poor Samson endured at their hands when they took him down to Gaza and caused him to grind in the prison house. 
Of course, you know how the story of Samson ends in, in wonderful triumph. And one day God will cause his people to triumph over the Gazaites. They have it their way in many instances today. But there will be a day of triumph. It's a picture also of the Lord Jesus Christ who in his death overcame his enemies. Or as Paul put it in Colossians chapter 2 in the verse 15 he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly triumphing over them in his death just like Samson lovely picture there of our saviour a lovely prophetic picture too of a triumph that's coming one day for the people represented by old Samson the hour of Israel's distress was ever Gaza's opportunity I'm nearly going to have to curtail myself here but in Amos chapter 1 in the verse 6 we read these words thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Gaza and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom and this is a reference to events that are further enlarged upon in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, the verses 16 and 17. Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance thereof that was found in the king's house and his sons also and his wives so that there was never a son left him save Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons. In a day of affliction for Israel, Gaza struck, saw the opportunity. So it has ever been. So it has ever been. Israel's hour of affliction. Gaza saw it as an hour of opportunity. God has not forgotten all these evil deeds. That's what we discover as we look at the purpose of God regarding Gaza. God hasn't forgotten these deeds. All those centuries ago. Upheavals of a very minor nature in comparison to the world's events. But God hasn't forgotten one of them. He says, I will visit them. I will visit them for their sin." As I have just read to you out of the book of Amos. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Amos and the chapter 1, the verses 68. God hasn't forgotten. There's a record of it there. There's, it stands as a crime in the books of God that will be visited by God's judgment. That ought to make us tremble, you know. It ought to bring home to us that though we cannot see God's writings against England or against Ireland or any other nation in the world, nevertheless, God has not forgotten the sins of the nations of the earth. Zechariah chapter 9 I'll read from verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach. And Damascus shall be the rest thereof. When the eyes of man and of all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord. When this that God is about to speak will take place. When the eyes of man... As of all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord. Do you know if that has happened yet? Are the eyes of Israel toward the Lord today? No, they're not. We must be talking of the future here. Oh, there's 
There can be found in history, you know, partial fulfillments of many of the prophecies of God regarding his judgments upon these nations. But there is always a reference that indicates to us that God specifically is speaking of a future time. A future time. Let me read on. Tyrus and Sidon, they would be very wise, and Tyrus did build herself a stronghold, and heaped up silver as the dust, and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Behold, the Lord will cast her out, and he will smite her power in the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. Ashkelon shall see it, and fear. Gaza also shall see it, and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Gaza and Escalon shall not be inherited and the bastard shall dwell in Ashdod and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines and I'll take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth but he that remaineth even he shall be for our God now I believe that Alexander the Great in his expeditions down the Mediterranean sea coast of this region was an instrument of God's judgment against the very people we're reading of here. But here again, there is an element in this prophecy that did not see fulfillment in the days of Alexander the Great. And it's this. I will take away his blood out of his mouth. And his abominations from between his teeth. This is a reference to his idolatrous practices. God says I'll take it away. But he that remaineth, even he shall be for our God. Here's a spiritual event taking place. A change within the Gazaite. That there has not been any trace of in the past and therefore I believe it's something that lies yet in the future he shall be for our God and he shall be as a governor in Judah and Ekron as a Jebusite and I will encamp about mine house because of the army because of him that passeth by and because of him that returneth and no oppressor shall pass through them any more for now have I seen with mine eyes You find references in Zephaniah, the chapter 2, that parallel events thus recorded in Zechariah 9. And again, look for the timeline. Look for the date stamp on it that links it to some particular event. And you'll find, especially there in Zephaniah chapter 2, there is a reference to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ's great victory. When the king shall come. And his coming will result of, with, will result in <coughs> peace among the nations of men. That has not happened. That has not happened. There has been a partial fulfillment of it in this gospel age. But, but there is not a fulfillment of it to the, to the letter. Now, either we... We look at this and say, well, God was just giving us a rough picture. We're not to take every word literally. We either say that or else we say, God, who believes that every word of Scripture is inspired, wants us to understand that every word he says will be fulfilled. And if that's the case, then no partial fulfillment in the past should satisfy us. But we should be looking for a full, a literal, every word fulfillment. And that requires us, therefore, to expect a future fulfillment of these things. Nearly 3,000 years have passed since incidents referred to in this passage that I've read to you from 2 Chronicles. Long forgotten by men, but not by God. And God will visit Gaza. What a lesson for sinners. If you're not saved tonight, there is a lesson here. We read 
in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 to verse 11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. Because God doesn't act immediately against sin, men say he, he doesn't notice, he doesn't care, God's not interested, but you're wrong. You're wrong. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 and 7. I'll just, I've got to say this in closing. I've got to say this. Despite the awful wickedness of Gaza, in its defiance and rebellion against God and its cruelty towards Israel, the Bible holds out hope for Gaza. Holds out hope. God will severely judge the Philistines. He will. However, he is going to spare a remnant of the Philistines. He's going to spare a remnant. I read to you some verses from Isaiah chapter 11. 10 to 14. Isaiah chapter 11, 10 to 14. And in that day... There shall be a root out of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath. And from the isles of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. And shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. And shall gather together the dispersed of Judah. From the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart. And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah. And Judah shall not vex Ephraim, but they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together, and they shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. This is God's recovery of a scattered people. I believe it will follow the return of Christ. And who is going to be helping in the recovery of Israel? The Philistines. They're going to carry them upon their shoulders. That's what the prophet says. That's what the prophet says. Zechariah 9, 7. There will be those that remain after the judgment. We are told, remaineth means to spare or a remnant. God's going to spare a remnant of the Philistines. They will be brought to a knowledge of Jehovah. Even he shall be for our God. Verse 7 of Zechariah 9. He shall be for God. That remnant. Those of the remnant. In the reign of Christ... The Philistines shall serve him by aiding Israel return to their land. Far-fetched? I don't think so. God always gives us something that encourages us to understand and believe that that will happen. God's going to work, you know, wonderfully. He's going to cause those Philistines who had lived for centuries to disinherit, to destroy Israel, to carry them on their shoulders back again to that land which God swore unto Abraham that he would give to his people forever. Do you know who the chief men of David were? You know his closest bodyguards? 
Philistines. Philistines. We read about the Cherethites. We read about the Gittites. And likely the Pelethites. These are three names you all find closely associated with that special troop or regiment of men who were dedicated to a personal loyalty to David and ready to give their lives for him. And they were all Philistines. They were all Philistines. They promoted the reign of David. They promoted the advancement of David. They promoted the one who was after God's heart. And that's a foretaste. That's a foreshadowing. Of a day when in the ranks of the servants of God. Who are furthering the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will be found those in whose veins there runs the blood of the Philistine. Do you remember what was said of Paul? This is what the grace of God does you know. He which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. That was Paul. That's what he told the Galatians. When it was heard what he was doing, what he was preaching, there was consternation amongst those whom he in the past had persecuted. They couldn't believe. But that's what the grace of God can do. Turn a Saul of Tarsus into the mighty servant of God, Paul the Apostle. And he's going to do it with a remnant of the Gazites. Oh, how glorious is our God's mercy. How glorious is our God's mercy. And when you take up the study of God's purpose for the Gazites. That's what you see. That's what you find out. That's what you discover. The love of God. The mercy of God. The grace of God. The wondrous bounty of God. To undeserving. Ill-deserving. hell deserving sinners. I've spoken far too long but may the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Brother, please.